This is the fourth ceasefire that both sides have agreed to, um, and that hasn't held thus far. Um, people are saying that there's been a bit of a reduction in the gunfire, but they're still hearing a lot of explosions, which is obviously a problem for any planes that might be trying to land to evacuate people. Um, Khartoum is slowly emptying out. It's becoming a bit of a ghost city, but there are still a lot of people stuck on the front lines. So what are some of the signs that a ceasefire could possibly hold? Um, <laughs> there's not really, I mean, the, the most hopeful thing is that it is a very important Muslim holiday today, the day of Eid. So there's been a lot of diplomatic pressure to call a ceasefire for this day. But all you need is one guy um, pressing a trigger and then the whole neighborhood lights up again. So it's still a very unstable situation. What are the hopes um, for the ceasefire and what will happen during it? So all nations have been absolutely desperate to evacuate their nationals. Um, there has been no protection for foreigners or international NGOs or anything like this here. People have been um, killed, shot in their homes, raped. Uh, warehouses have been torn open. UN offices have been targeted by snipers. It's complete anarchy. And so everyone is very anxious to get out their staff, especially because this was a family posting, so people are there with their children. Is a three-day pause enough for civilians to reach safety, as the UN Secretary General Antonio Guterres has urged is necessary as a minimum? Um, it would help, certainly, because people need to leave the capital city. And I don't know how many planes they might be able to bring in. You know, there are many, many thousands of people, tens of thousands potentially, of foreign nationals that need to be taken out. Um, if they can even get out by road, if they manage to get to Port Sudan, which is controlled by the military and could evacuate by sea, there's lots of different options. But right now you have people pinned down in their homes, um, mortars and artillery going off around them, 40 degree heat, no electricity, no water for days. Well, the UN says up to 20,000 people have already fled, mostly women and children. Are we expecting a lot more to flee in the coming days? I would say we're going to see millions of people on the move. Um, because don't forget, it's not just Khartoum that's affected. You also have major cities like um, Niala, um, Al Fashir. Fighting has been extremely intense there. The markets have been looted. The hospitals have been shut down. Families have been hit by artillery shells in their homes. Um, this is a war of such intense ferocity in people's backyards, in, in some cases crashing through the windows. What hopes are there for the two sides to reach some sort of agreement and what could that look like? So there's not much hope right now, given that this is the fourth ceasefire that they're trying to get to hold. Uh, yesterday, the military said it would only accept defeat and surrender, and Hemeti has said that he wants the president to either in court or to die like a dog. So those are not language from two men that are eager to sit down at the negotiating table. I think both of them see this as an existential sort of fight to the finish. What pressure is the international community putting on the groups to bring fighting to an end, and do you think it'll work? Well, part of the problem is that Sudan was an international pariah anyway before this conflict started because of the 2021 coup. Um, it's deeply, deeply in debt, um, but debt relief was suspended because of the coup. And um, it's been close to Russia. Uh, but unfortunately, we're not, nobody's entirely sure what pressure, what direction Ru Russia might like to put pressure on. Um, so right now, everybody's making phone calls and the bullets are still flying. How long do you think this fighting will last? And after this ceasefire, do you think things will ratchet up even more? Everyone is praying and hoping for, the one, the ceasefire to last, and two, the fighting to be over. But the problem is both sides have got um, very extensive sort of financial resources that they can draw on. The military owns um, a, you know, the biggest bank in Sudan, the biggest agricultural company. Um, Hemeti comes from an extremely wealthy family um, and has extensive business interests in the UAE. Um, they have a large offshore account that have been tracked by, um, by financial conflict watchdogs like Global Witness. So they've got money. And when you've got money, you can buy weapons.
Can you bring us up to date on the situation in Khartoum at the moment, particularly from a humanitarian point of view? So the situation in Khartoum has been absolutely desperate. They, this war exploded when people were just in the middle of going about their daily lives. So mothers were separated from their children. Kids have had to take shelter in the basements of schools where you know they've been shot when they venture out. Um, families have been trying to to decide whether they should venture onto a street, which is you know is the site of a live battle. Or stay in their house and risk, you know, a bomb falling through the roof. The, the worst part is um, a lot of electricity has been shut off. There's very little water. People are having to drink from the river. Um, most of the major hospitals have closed. Nine of them have been hit by uh, mortars or artillery fire. There's no blood. There's no water. There's no. Um, there's no doctors. Everyone is just getting out as soon as they can. But sometimes when you get out, you're killed. Absolutely dire situation, Catherine Horold. Thank you. Thank you so much.